morning, everyone. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer and we'll stand. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and your many blessings, Father, your goodness to us. We meet here today, we gather here for you and you alone, and we pray that you're glorified this morning through these songs and the words spoken and everything else. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. We're starting off with stand up, stand up for Jesus. I think there's two versions of this one, we're doing the uh, 646, I think, yeah, all right, yeah. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vain. And Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto Stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him who overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. I guess I'm up again. I'm sorry. Uh, so, last, this past Wednesday we had a missionary service. And uh, when I see people like that, it was Monte, Monte, was it Monte? Or Monte, yeah. And Bethany, they uh, missionaries to all Central um, America. And uh, when I think of those people, I'm thinking of these these people are living out, going into making disciples of all nations. And, I mean, that, that, that's their livelihood. I mean, it's our calling, but that was their livelihood. They've made that decision. And uh, these, this song that I meditated on, I mean, I was going through the missions section on here, and uh, it's called If Jesus Goes With Me. I've never done it before. I don't ever remember doing it here before. So David's going to play through it once, again, get you familiar to it, and uh, we'll go from there. But it's good. So everyone, please stand, and we're going to sing 549, If Jesus Goes With Me.
It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, where'er I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It may be I must carry the blessed word of life across the burning deserts to those in sinful strife. And though it be my lot to bear my colors there, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, where'er I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. But if it be my portion to bear my cross at home, while others bear their burdens beyond the billows foam, I'll prove my faith in him, confess his judgments fair. And if he stays with me, I'll stay anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, where I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It is not mine to question the judgments of my Lord. It is but mine to follow the leadings of his word. But if I go or stay, or here, here, or there, I'll be with my Savior, content anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, where I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Thank you. I know that was something we've never heard before, but it's pretty fun. Our next song is a classic. We all know it is a 42. And well, you guys don't have this book, but in Christ alone, I used to sing this on singing group when I was in college, and uh, I get pretty emotional sometimes because this is a uh, it's what it's all about. Amen. In Christ alone. strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter I 
I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay the light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine fought with the precious blood of christ in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand turns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, I'd like for all that would just to gather in around and we're just going to seek him out this morning. We're just going to bring our needs and our petitions to him. And we know that uh, he hears and answers our prayer when we call to him. And so this morning, let's just let's just seek him out today. Seek him out. The one who bore the sins of the world. Who made it possible for us to be able to conquer death, hell, and the grave. And so let's just continue to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we have got to come into your house to worship you. Lord, we come in today, and, and Lord, the only preconceived notion that we have is, Lord, be with us. <laughs> Lord, you fall in this place. Lord, that's all we need. If you show up, if you move, if you do the work, then, Lord, it is good to be in your house. And so, Lord, that's what we ask for today. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you just meet with us. And we be with you, and you speak to us, and you draw us in, and you call us friend, and you call us your children, and you call us, Lord, that we are the ones who's been bought by the blood of the Lamb, the one who paid the price. And so, Lord, this morning I pray all throughout this sanctuary, Lord, right now, there are people who need a touch from you. Lord, Lord, we right now, yes, we are a needy people. We're a needy people in the sense that, Lord, we need you constantly. And so, Lord, this is no different of a time. We still come and say, Lord, we need you. Would you touch right now? Would you speak? Lord, you know the one that is brokenhearted. And, Lord, we ask, would you move? You know the one, dear Heavenly Father, that the week has been so tough that they didn't even know if they could make it today. And, Lord, they're here. And so, Lord, I pray, would you touch them? 
Lord, I, I pray for the one that's sick. Lord, that just hadn't felt good. I, I pray for an anointing upon them, even at this very moment. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them and they would know that the healing power of an almighty God has rested upon them. I, I pray for the one, Lord Jesus, that has had a struggle in the mind this week. Lord, you are the one that can come in and you can take every thought captive. And Lord Jesus, you can move it in such a way that Satan can have no power, no control, no aspect over our thoughts, over what we do. Because, Lord Jesus, you came and you conquered everything that Satan tried to do. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that this morning as we are here, as we are in this place, that, Lord, we just continually seek you. We continually worship you. Lord, as we have sung these songs, as we have talked about how good you have been to us, how you gave us things we didn't deserve, how you answer our prayers, how you, Lord, lead us where we need to be, I pray, Lord, that you just continue to just draw us close to you. Lord, I ask for an anointing right now in this place, an anointing of the Holy Spirit to fall in such a mighty way that, Lord Jesus, everyone that is sitting here today would feel the touch from you. Lord, may no one be left out. May no one let you pass by. But Lord, may they ask, would you stop and stay a while? Would we be able to sit at your feet? And Lord, be speaking to our life. Lord, encourage the discouraged this morning. Heal the brokenhearted. Set the captive free. Bring home the prodigals, Lord. We ask, Lord Jesus, would you do that for us today? We need you. We need you. Lord, just have your way through the remainder of this service. This is your time. And we're your people. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done. And Lord, what you're going to do. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. I would also like for, I'd like for all the teens and the workers that are going to camp and then also all the children and the workers that are going to be going to camp with them. Would you all just come up front and we're actually, as a church, we're going to pray over you. Because we, we, we don't want to just send our kids and our teens to camp and say, hope you have a good time. But we want to send our kids and teens to camp because God's got a plan for their lives. And so may we see that lived out and fulfilled this week at camp. And so it's all, isn't this a great group that's going? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so for some of you all that weren't able uh, to go this time, next year, be planning on this. Because it's a great time. It's a great time. And so what we're going to do is I, I want all of you all to stand up. I want all of you all to stand up. And I, I want you all just to truly, just to, if, if you can, just stretch out your hand. And we're just, we're going to pray over them, all right? We're going to pray over them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for these teens and these kids that are getting ready to go to camp. And so, Lord, this week, what we ask, we ask, would you give them traveling mercies? Would you keep them safe? Would you protect them? But, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, may this week be the week that they fall more in love with you than they ever have before in their lives. May this be the week that their lives are transformed even more for you. May this be the week that they surrender all. May this be the week that they are filled to the top. May this be the week that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the plan God has for my life. May this be the week. May this be the week. May this be the week that, Lord, you move in such a mighty way. Oh, Lord, may your presence be felt. Even at this moment until they get back. And when they get back, Lord, may it not stop. But Lord, we want to see the fire fall in the lives of our children and our teens. And so, Lord, we ask, would you do that? Lord, I pray for all these workers up here that are going to go. I, I pray, Lord, for an anointing upon them. And so, Lord, what I ask is this. May this not just be a vacation time for them. May it not be just a fun time for them. Oh, Lord, but this, this be a time that they truly, once again, 
been filled to the top with who you are. May you overflow in their lives. And I pray, Lord, that they'd be able to speak into the lives of our children and our teens. I pray, Lord, that everyone they come in contact with down there, that, dear Heavenly Father, you use them to be the light and shine in the darkness, Lord. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that these workers come back and they don't come back tired, but they come back more refreshed than they've ever been. May they come back full of the Holy Spirit, ready to do a work in Lancaster, Kentucky, like never before. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, because of their willingness and their faithfulness to be able to do this, I pray, Lord, you bless all of their ministries. You touch them. I pray, Lord, also, I pray, Lord, also for the children and the teens of our church that maybe aren't able to go on this trip right now. But, Lord Jesus, you're doing a work in their lives as well. And so, Lord, I pray this morning, even this very moment, Lord, would you speak into their lives. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you draw them close to you. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would raise them up for such a time as this. And I pray, Lord, that all of our children, all of our teens, they get on the same page. And Lancaster Church of the Nazarene will never look the same again. Because we have children and teens so full of the Holy Spirit that they just can't wait to see other children and teens get to know you. And so, Lord, I pray you do the work today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will become a church that's just fanatical for you. Lord, that we may become a church that's not worried about the label that somebody may put on us. Oh, but may we just ask for more of you so that our children and our teens have an example to live by. And so, Lord, you touch us now. And we're going to give you praise for everything that you're going to do this morning, this week, and in the weeks, months, and years to come. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross for us. Because it conquered death, hell, and the grave. Thank you for freedom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
morning. I don't think I need to sing anymore because he played the song I was uh, going to sing, and we didn't even know that. Yeah, but um, this is Because He Lives, I'm sure everybody knows it. But I picked out a version that's a little different. There's only two of the main uh, verses, but feel free to sing along and sing with me. God sent his son They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He lived and died to buy my pardon An empty grave is there to prove My Savior lives Because He lives I can face tomorrow Final war with pain And then as death Gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory And I'll know he lives Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know Because he lives Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives All fear it is gone Because I know He holds my future And life is worth the living Just because He lives And life is worth the living Just because he lives, because he lives. And if you have your Bibles with you, we're 
you'll turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And after you have found that, if you would, stand out of reverence of God's word. Matthew chapter 21. And before we do that, I actually meant to do this a while back, but... uh, so there, there was a wedding that happened in between uh, the district assembly and when I went on vacation, and I forgot to announce uh, a, a new couple in the church that now are married. And so uh, Michael and Haley Rector, so you just, you just wave. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, so that's good. So, oh, me. And so I do apologize that, uh, that I waited so long, but I was gone, and then everything slipped my mind. So congratulations to them. And so... All right, so Matthew chapter 21, and we'll be starting at verse 33. And the word of the Lord, spoken by Jesus himself, says this. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. And when the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. Verse 39. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Verse 45. When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you live. Thank you, Lord, that you reign. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for all that you are doing. And We ask, Lord, that you just continue to draw us close to you. And Lord, we're going to give you praise in advance for what you're going to continue to do in this place. Lord, would you touch me, hide me behind the cross. Lord, that every word that is said comes directly from you. Lord, touch my mouth and my lips. Lord, we trust you right now. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. You may be seated. There's... A nursery rhyme that goes like this. Many of you all have heard it. Many of you all have known it for a very long time. It says something like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. All right. I'm preaching out of the Reader's Digest this morning. I'm just joking. So Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty did what? Had a great fall. Then all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. It's interesting, by, by the way, that there's a lot of different ideas of where this nursery rhyme came from. It originated in England, and if you were to go back and look at nursery rhymes that originated in England, they're kind of scary. <laughs> it's probably not something that you want to talk to your kid about right before they go to bed, because they won't sleep. But here we have this whole story of Humpty Dumpty. And to think about it, it's pretty sad to have a nursery rhyme where something is broken and can't be fixed. <laughs> and then our kids grow up and they're repeating a nursery rhyme about something that's broken that can't be fixed. 
And we're like, that's right, but it's not right. That's wrong. <laughs> and so I want us to think this morning that the nursery rhyme is true in a sense. It's true in a sense that there are too many things of the world that people are looking for to try to fix Humpty Dumpty. There's too many things that people are looking for to try to fix their son or their daughter, their husband or their wife, trying to be able to fix their family, their work. You see, the problem is truly this. All the king's horses and all the king's men can't put you insert name back together again. If you really look around, now more than ever, it is more prevalent that people are searching for something other than what we as Christians know to try to put them back together. They're looking for something that is a quick fix. They're looking for something that will be sufficient, but for only just a moment. This morning, I want to preach a message just entitled this, Because of the Stone. Because of the stone. Jesus in chapter 21 and 22 begins to tell some parables. We've, we've read these parables. You've heard these parables preached on and taught on and sung about. But he gives three of them to us. And uh, the first one is of the two sons. Right? Remember the parable of the two sons. Then he gives the parables of the tenants, which is the second. And then the third one is the parable of the wedding feast. And all of these really go hand in hand. So if we had enough time, I guess I could preach from beginning to the end of the three parables. Because really, Jesus was just trying to get his point across. Just using it in a different way. And so today, I want us to look at this parable of the tenants. Uh, this parable that Jesus began to speak to the crowds, but also to the Pharisees, to the teachers, to the scribes that would have been around also at this time. And so this parable, this story, that illustrates a moral or spiritual lesson Jesus used quite a bit. And he would come in and he would tell these parables, he would share these stories so that people could understand really the way they needed to live, the things that they needed to do. So we have to remember that Jesus has entered the temple by this time. So it's, he's not on the mountain, right? So he's not doing the Sermon on the Mount. He actually goes into the temple. He goes into the place where they would read the scripture. He goes into the place of where they would be doing their teaching, and he just kind of interrupts the aspect. You, you do realize Jesus interrupts our lives. And so if you're going about your daily life not thinking of Jesus, trust me, he will interrupt it. He'll interrupt, and I'll tell you this. According to our lives, it's at the most inopportune time that we could ever think of. Right? right in the middle of the thing that we believe is most important, Jesus breaks in and says, uh, you need to stop whatever you thought was important. We've got to deal with this. Right? That's just Jesus. Guess what he does here? The scribes and the Pharisees thought they had something important that they were getting ready to teach that day. And Jesus breaks in. <laughs> Jesus says, just let me tell a couple of parables real quick. You already don't like me anyway, so let's just do it, right? So Jesus shows up and he begins to do this. So as we look at that, think about this parable here in verse 33 as he begins to start it. And he begins to talk about the master of the house. Well, the master of the house, we would realize that that's God. He's the one that is the master. He's the one that owns it all. It's him that we are to serve. And so as he goes on down through this, said that he planted a vineyard. Well, we realize that the vineyard is going to be the called out of Exodus, right? Which we would know as the Jewish nation, the Israelites, that we would realize. See, Jesus puts up, man, he is good. It's almost like he's God in the flesh, right? And so he, he begins to tell this story here. And then he continues to go on down after they planted a vineyard. It, it says that he leased it to the tenants, now, the tenants that he's talking about is going to be the religious leaders of the day, right? So he gives it out to them, leases it out to those because there's some things that need to be done. So now you're the tenants of the aspect of it, he would say. And as you move into verse 34, in verse 34 it says, When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants. So now we realize his servants are going to be the Old Testament prophets. 
What Jesus, listen, Jesus didn't come on the scene to preach something new that they had never heard. Jesus took what had always been and preached it in a way that they would understand that what has always been will always be. Right? God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament is still the same God. Jesus just brought it together so that we understand what's going on. So what he does is he brings all this back to what they were probably going to teach on that day. Now, we don't realize what they were going to teach on because it doesn't tell us. But if I know God the way I know God, I guarantee you these parables probably lined up with something they were going to teach that Jesus says, I need to help the people out a little more than what you do. And so I'm going I'm to share with them really what's going on. And so he does this and he, he talks about his servants being those Old Testament prophets that come in. And so as you see in verse 35, uh, as he brought these, old, uh, uh, brought these uh, servants in, it says that the tenants, now remember, who are the tenants? The religious leaders. Watch what Jesus does here. He sent the servants, the Old Testament prophets, but now the tenants end up being on the scene. The religious leaders of the day. And it says that they took his servants, the Old Testament prophets, right? Now watch what he goes on and says. It says that they beat one, killed another, and stoned another. You know what he's doing? He's just telling what happened in the Old Testament. That they would have known throughout history. That they would have had already written down. And what he says is this. Let me tell you what you did. And you know what the religious leaders had to do? Sit there. They couldn't. You know why? Because really he's telling the story that they're grabbing. Now watch this. Sometimes there's some that catch on faster than what other people catch on. You ever been in that crowd? Maybe you were the one that caught on last. <laughs> you ever been there? It's like everything else is going on and everybody else has got it. And then you get home and you're like, oh, <laughs> I, I got that now. Well, I guarantee you there were some of the religious leaders that were exactly that way. But I guarantee you there was others that knew exactly when Jesus started talking. Okay, we see where this is going, right? Some people figured out a little bit faster. They still had to sit there and listen to the parable. So he goes through this part, and then you get down to verse 36. I'm, I'm running through this real quick so that we understand where we're at because i got something else I'm going to preach on, right? So get down to verse, well, y'all didn't know that, but I told you now, right? So now you understand. Uh, verse 36, it says, Jesus says, he did the same thing again. The master, the owner, the one that's in control, does the same thing again. He says, hey, I'm going to send some more tenants out, or uh, servants out to where the tenants are at. So I, I need them to go out there. And it says that they did the exact same thing again. So then Jesus begins to tell something else that now is getting ready to awaken. Now watch. Jesus speaks in a way that it awakens what God has already been dealing with us about. And Jesus begins to speak here right after this part. And he says an interesting thing here. In verse 37, he says, finally... That means this is it. It says, finally, he sent his son. You remember what Jesus had been saying the whole time, right, that he had been teaching? You remember what Jesus had been telling people? You remember what Jesus let his disciples know? You remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? You, you remember what Jesus would say? Jesus never backed down from what he claimed to be. He always spoke with authority about who he was. And so we get to this point, and it says, finally, he sent his son to them. The son we would know already to be Jesus in this parable. Jesus puts himself in there as the son. I, I like how Mark chapter 12, verse 6 puts it, because now we have that story coming from Mark, who would have wrote the gospel first, and everybody else kind of pins stories off of his. Uh, but we have Mark that, that says it like this, and it says, He had still one other, a beloved son. That sounds interesting, don't it? It actually sounds familiar of John chapter 3, verse 16. All right? So all of a sudden we see Jesus is teaching. It's getting closer and closer to his time when he's getting ready to lay down his life. And so what he said was this. Here, I need to make sure we get the ball rolling so people understand. And it says, finally, he sent his beloved son, his only one, to go to these people and here's the reason. It says, <clears throat> they will respect my son. 
You ever thought that you were getting ready to walk into something and people were going to respect you because of who you were or the authority that you had or the really the knowledge that maybe you had and yet it actually went the other direction? You ever been there? Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. If you hadn't, you probably will be before too long. <laughs> oh, me. But it says this in verse 38. But when the tenants... When the tenants, the religious leaders, saw the son, that is Jesus, it says that they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us get... You do remember Jesus knew the thoughts. You remember that? Remember that part? Who has the power to forgive sins? Remember that story? And the guy's going, uh, how'd you know that? Jesus already knew their intent. He knew their intent from the beginning. He knew what was getting ready to happen. All he does is this. Let me reveal to you what I already know that you're getting ready to do. Right? So he puts it in a parable. Gets it in a way that they're getting ready to understand what's getting ready to happen. Not only to them. But also he realized what's getting ready to happen to himself. You see, sometimes the greatest thing we can do is when we know something is getting ready to happen to us, is go ahead and say, I know what's getting ready to happen, but I still won't back down from that part. See, that's the part about being a Christian. A Christian, now watch this, not Christian in name. A Christian that lives it out is a Christian that says, I know what's getting ready to happen, yet I'm still going to live this way anyway. It doesn't matter the persecution. It doesn't matter who's going to make fun of me. It doesn't matter what people are going to say. I'm still going to live out what he's done in my life. No matter where I am. Jesus lets them know, I'm still doing what I've been sent to do. And so here he gets to this point. And when he gets down to the finally, when he gets down to the but, when he gets down to all of this part. Jesus truly sees and allows them to know what's happening. In verse 39 He goes on to say this of the parable. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed them. What Jesus says is this. What they thought about doing, they carried out. Now listen, you know what the scriptures had had talked about since Jesus came on the scene? It was the thought about what the religious leaders were going to do of the day. They hadn't carried it out. They hadn't pushed it through. But they've been thinking about it. They've been plotting it. They've been planning it. And Jesus says this. I already know what you're getting ready to do. Already know what's going through your mind. I know really what's in your heart. That's the reason Jesus says I can call you a whitewashed tomb because I know what's on the inside. Right? So you get to this point and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, long before we see it in Scripture, all of a sudden the religious leaders are like, (laughs) he does know. (laughs) He does know. I believe this, in a sense, this is just me. I believe there was no denying that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Even with the religious leaders that tried to say no, they still couldn't deny it. They couldn't deny it. The part was, their problem, I'm getting ready, no, I'm going to jump ahead of myself. Oh, man, slow down, slow down. All right, so here we get to this part. We, we remember that this type of language of what Jesus is speaking, about what's getting ready to happen, about the parable aspect Happened in the Old Testament. God just used people and fulfilled it in that way. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? You remember the book of Hosea? You you remember that story, right? It's a story that sometimes we don't like to read to our kids. (laughs) Because God tells Hosea, go get the prostitute and marry Gomer. And you, you remember there was a reason that God was doing this. Remember that? Remember that story of Hosea, Old Testament prophet? He comes on the scene, wasn't very long lived. But God used it. And so he told him to go do it. And he says, now this is what I want you to do. You're going to have kids. When you have kids, I've got names that I want you to give to them. And the reason he says that I want you to give them the names is because I want Israel to understand who they really are. I've got a whole plan in all of this. And so remember the first child that he had, uh, they called him Jezreel. And then the next one that he has, he calls them no mercy. And then the next child that he has, he calls them not my people. Now, the reason that he gets, now that's strange, isn't it? You all got, hey, what's your name? Not my people. No, no, what's your name? No, not my people. (laughs) Boy, that's a long conversation of trying to figure out why were you named that? 
Do you realize God's got a plan for you? And it's not based upon what your earthly parents, what your earthly mom, what your have called you. It's what Jesus Christ has called you. That's the name that you go by. It's a lot better if we walk around. What's your name? I'm a child of the king. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You wouldn't get a lot of people talking to you. That'd probably spread pretty quick. They wouldn't want to do it. But anyway, we see this. And he's referring to what Israel was at that time. He's referring, and he's going to take the book of Hosea, bring it all the way back around. And what he does is this. He doesn't leave them without any hope. What he says is this. I'm going to take those names, and then I'm going to show you how I'm going to bring those names round about to actually be a blessing to who Israel is. Be a blessing to what my people are. And so all of a sudden, you can get back. You remember the Song of Solomon? Y'all remember that book? Book, the Song of Solomon. I wonder who wrote that. But anyway, have this. I don't know if you realize this or not. It's not the book that you want to sit down and read with your mom. Just letting you know. Some of you are like, what do you mean? Go home and read it this afternoon by yourself. <laughs> then, then you go from there. Why? Because it talks about the love that God has for his children. Now watch. When I say children, you're going to read the, the Song of Solomon, and you're going to say, this is Solomon talking about the love he has for his wife. Absolutely. You know why? Because God put Solomon into the love of his wife to show how God loves the people of Israel in that way. And it is very detailed. Uh, by the way, you ain't got to watch all that junk on TV. Just read the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Some of y'all still don't get it. I'm telling you, go home and read it. You'll come back tonight and you'll laugh. So anyway, but, oh me. But we also have to remember that really all through the Old Testament, we have this happening. If you were to read the book of Jeremiah, if you were to read the book of Isaiah, if you were to read the book of Ezekiel, if you were to read all these old, what God does, he says, this is what's going on, but let me show you what's going to be. I'm not going to leave you like this. And this is where Jesus is coming in. And he starts talking about all the things that have happened, all the things that are going on right now, but he doesn't leave it that way. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't leave us the way that we were? And so here's what we find. In verse 40, it says, When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Right? What Jesus says is this, looking at the religious leaders of the day. Now listen, there were other people around as well. But understand who Jesus is talking to, really. And he says, hey, religious leaders, when my father comes back, what's he going to do to you all? Now that, that hits home pretty quick in the way Jesus is portraying this to them. And he's telling this parable. Verse 41, it didn't say that Jesus answered. It said they answered. Now listen, when, when that, if you were to go back, it says they answered. It's alluding to the Pharisees. It's alluding, alluding to the scribes and the teachers. Why? Because number one, they always thought they knew everything. And so Jesus allowed them to speak. Now watch. They say this in verse 41. They said to him, to Jesus, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Man, you know what they did? They nailed it. <laughs> Not even realizing what they nailed, they nailed exactly what was getting ready to happen. And all of a sudden, verse 42, Jesus said to them, he turns it back, have you never read? Really what he's saying is this, I know you have, but I'm getting ready to reveal something to you. Now come on. How many times you've been reading through that scripture, and it's the same scripture you read through a thousand times, and the Lord stopped you and says, have you never read? You know why? Because we don't know it all. And number one, now what? And we still don't know it all. And number two, we're never going to know it all. And number three, praise the Lord that I serve a God that does know it all. And so when I'm opening up the word, and I'm studying through there, and the Lord says, whoa, whoa, whoa hold a second. Have you never read? Oh, well, hang on. Yeah, I have. He says, no, 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 you're not understanding. Have you never read? 
Have you never, has it never come to your mind? Have you never thought about it in this way? And he says in verse 42, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now Psalm 118 is where he's going to get this passage of scripture from. And so Jesus quotes the psalmist that they would have studied, that they would have known. And he begins to put in, have you never read about the cornerstone? Have you never read about the ones that they rejected? Have you never read about that? And then he goes on down. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now, what he does is he takes this whole story that he has, puts it into a parable, reveals it not only to the religious leaders of the day, but even to the people around that really people weren't grabbing a hold of it. The religious leaders were starting to figure it out. And when he brings Psalm 118 in, it begins to make more sense to them. And they begin to say, oh, the cornerstone. We know what the cornerstone's all about. We know the reason that you've got to have the cornerstone. We know the reason that it's put in the place that it's in. And so Jesus goes on down. Verse 43, watch this. In verse 43, <clears throat> imagine Jesus saying this inside the temple. Not on the mountain. Not in someone else's house in secret. Not with Nicodemus. But to the religious leaders of the day, Jesus says, verse 43. Can you imagine this? This is what's going to happen. I want, when I count to three, I want you all to do this. <gasps> okay, you ready? Well, that's good. I mean, I mean you're ready. One, two, three. <gasps> that's what happened. <laughs> because Jesus looks at them and says, verse 43, watch. <clears throat> Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Jesus just told the scribes and the Pharisees, you ain't producing no fruit. Jesus just looked at the religious leaders of the day and says, no more. Jesus just looked at a people who thought that they were doing something good on their own. And Jesus says, you ain't even figured it out because I know your thoughts. I know your hearts. I know what's inside of you. And I know really what's going on. And the thing that's coming out is not what God wants. Because you don't produce fruit. And so he says, what God, what my father is getting ready to do is he's taking it away from you because you have not produced a single thing. And he's going to give it to people. Now, I wonder who he's going to give it to. I could have preached the other parables because in the other parables it tells us in the parable of the two sons. Because in the parable of the two sons, Jesus says this in verse 31. Which of the two will do the will of his father? Now we go through that whole thing. Now once again, guess who's answering? The Pharisees and the scribes. And Jesus says this on down. They said the first and Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, Pharisees and the scribes. That the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Woo! Did you get that? The two things that the Jewish people hated. The prostitute and the tax collectors. And Jesus looks at them and says, they're getting into heaven before you do. They're going to make it before you. Remember Jesus, that's the first parable and he keeps going with two more. <laughs> Now, watch what Jesus says, the reason for, verse 32. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed in him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. What Jesus says, there was never a change in your life. So I'll move on to parable number two. And when we get to verse 43, Jesus says, because you never produced any fruit, because you would not allow God to deal with your heart, then this is what's getting ready to happen. It's no longer yours. We'll give it to somebody else. Because if you're not going to be faithful with it, I'll find somebody that will. Now listen, that should be dangerous to anybody that calls himself a Christian in this room. Because if you're going to live your life fruitless, do not think that this parable is not talking about you. Because it is. And it's hitting you squarely direct in the face this morning that if you're not producing fruit, he says, thank you, I'll remove it from you and I'll give it to the person that will produce fruit. And this is what he says to us. Now watch. The person that you think is the vilest and that you're better than, they'll get into heaven before you do. Woo! Man! Aren't y'all so encouraged this morning? I just, By the way, this is Jesus' words. You can't argue with this. 
unbelievable. Man, Jesus says this in the temple. The awe goes out. And we see this thing of a brood of vipers that John the Baptist would call them. <laughs> standing in Jesus' midst. And even though John the Baptist has been beheaded and no longer with them, Jesus, as you remember, the scripture tells us that he picked up the torch. You remember the message that he started out preaching? God loves you. Oh, wait. Man, wouldn't we have thought that would have been it? Actually, it wasn't. You know what the first message was Jesus pre preached? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why? Love everybody that you want to. Unless you repent it, it doesn't do any good. Right? Okay. So anyway, we get down to this part. John the Baptist would even say this. Now listen. To the Pharisees and the scribes that came to see him baptizing people. You remember that? And listen what John the Baptist says in Matthew chapter 3. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Man, John the Baptist didn't mince words either. And Jesus picks it right up and continues to say the same thing. And he says, because you all did not bear fruit, it's taken from you. Can't allow you to keep it because you're not doing anything with it. What Jesus now says is the message of who he is is now going to be more not for them, but now it's going to be more for the Gentiles. It's going to be for the ones who are grafted in, which is going to be us. Unless you're Jewish descent, I, I doubt probably anybody else is in here. But anyway, think of it as Gentiles. And we've been engrafted in. And what was taken from them was given to us. Why? Because what we talked about, Jesus laid down his life. And he conquered death, hell, and the grave. So the rest of us, listen, all of us would not have to die and go to hell. We had the opportunity to call upon the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of sins. And the thing about it is why was it taken away? Is they didn't want to hear it anymore. You do realize Jesus already knew where they were. And it came down to this. His time's getting short. They're getting ready to take him out. And he says, y'all don't want to hear me anymore. Remember the very last part. It says they didn't do anything to him. You know the only reason why they were scared to death of the crowds. Because the crowds thought him to be a prophet. The same reason they didn't do anything to John the Baptist. Because the, the crowds thought him to be a prophet. They were scared to death of that part of it. They thought that they had it figured out and wanted to do it their way. You ever met anybody like that? <laughs> if we ever, as a church, as a group, as individuals, ever want to do it our way because it's our way, then I'll tell you it'll come crumbling down real quick. And the Lord will look at us and say, you're not bearing fruit. I'm taking it away from you. Because it's not about my way or your way. It's about his way. We do what he asks us to do. You see, if we are not careful... We could end up in the same place, now watch this, that the Pharisees and scribes are. I just wanted to let you know that I have met with a lot of people and I've been in a lot of people's homes and I've counseled a lot of people that would look at me straight in the eye and say they are right with Jesus. That they're going to make it to heaven. And yet the life that they live with the fruit that they have is not. Now, if you really love somebody, what do you tell them? Yeah, you're going to make it. No, if you really love somebody, you do exactly what Jesus says. He said, well, Pastor Dwayne, that just sounds harsh. Well, then evidently Jesus was harsh. <laughs> because Jesus was willing to be so honest with people that when they stand before him on judgment day, they'll never be able to say, now watch this, you do realize these people will stand before Jesus on judgment day as well. It's not just going to be the ones here. Everyone will. And what Jesus says is this, when you stand before me, I'm going to judge you in equity. I'm going to judge you in fairness. And so you're never, watch this, I never, you're never, and neither will they ever be able to say, Jesus didn't tell me. Why? Because Jesus loves us enough that he calls out where we're not supposed to be at. Jesus loves us enough that he calls out the things we're not supposed to do. And you know what he's entrusted us to, the ones who call ourselves Christians? The ones who call ourselves, listen to this, the fellowship of believers. You know what we're to do? 
If we see someone not doing what they should, run the other way and hide in the cave. <laughs> oh, wait, that's not right. <laughs> it actually says go to them. And maybe they'll repent and see the error of their way. And a multitude of sins will be covered. By the way, if you call yourself a Christian, that's your job. Your job is to look out for your brother and sister in Christ. Now listen, not just to be nosy, but to say I really love them enough that I'll be honest with them in the things that are going on. You see, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul would instruct Timothy in this way. Now watch, if we're not careful, we will end up here because we think love gets people to heaven. Now watch this. If love got people to heaven, Jesus didn't have to die on a cross. Grab hold of this. If love was the only way, Jesus could have come and said, I love you and everything's good. Jesus could have come and showed his love, right? Jesus could have come and showed his love outside of what scripture tells us in such a way that he shook somebody's hand and they got forgiven. Actually, it says Jesus loved us so much in so much that he died on a cross so that we can be forgiven, so that the sins of the world will be covered. And so now we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, and Paul says this to young Timothy. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but they will have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth, and now watch this, and wander off into myths. I wish I could say I don't know anyone that's ever done that. But the problem is I know quite a few. And I guarantee you may too. And I pray that it's not you. But if we're not careful, if we're not careful, take heed lest you fall. Keep on guard. And Paul says these words to him. Because... Jesus would say this in the very next verse, in verse 44. And the one who falls on this stone, remember he's going back to the cornerstone. Remember he's going back to Psalm 118. Remember actually he's going all the way back to the beginning. Remember he's going back to actually this was plan A from the beginning. There never was a plan B. Jesus would die for the sins of the world. And he says in verse 44. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. That, that, that fall, that aspect of stumbling, that aspect of going down. I wish I could say no one's ever fallen. No one's ever stumbled. But the fact of the matter is there's many. But Jesus says it in this way, not Humpty Dumpty. You see, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And it broke him. And no one, no one could put him back together. And yet Jesus tells us a story about if anyone falls on this. Now watch. If anyone falls on this stone in verse 44, he'll be broken to pieces. That word pieces is actually the word shattered. It does not mean that it's split right in half. And if you take super glue, you can put it back together and you never know that anything was wrong. Uh, this means shattered into so many pieces you can't put it back together. It means that if you are to search long enough, it's always that piece. You ever drop something on your floor and it's always that. It seems like you got everything back together and yet it's the piece that's under the stove that you didn't look for. <laughs> and it's really the piece that matters the most because really it's going to hold everything else together. All of a sudden we see Jesus telling them, a story about the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. The one who stumbles. The word also there could be the one who's offended. I know no one's ever been offended by Jesus' words. But can I tell you, the only way that you got saved is you were offended. Why is that? Because he dealt with however you were living, just like he dealt with however I was living. And you know what that does to start with? I can't believe that he would deal with me about that. We almost get offended. But you can't get saved without it. Because you've got to realize who you are. And I had to realize who I was to get to the place of salvation. You see, Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, verse 23, And blessed is the one who is not 
offended by me, who doesn't stumble in what I say, who doesn't trip up because I actually come and speak into their life and say that is not the correct path, this is the correct path. Well, why is that the right path? You ever had an argument with the Lord? Why do I have to go that way? I would like to go my way. This way seems a lot better. Jesus talked about people that would do that as well, right? (laughs) But I wonder, I wonder if that offended also meaning resentful. That offended also meaning annoyed. That offended also meaning angry. That offended also meaning upset. That offended being meaning this, that what Jesus said, what Jesus did, how Jesus lived, and the life that he shed, listen, the blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of the sins of the world is even still today offensive to many people. There are people right now that want to take the blood out of the scripture because the blood is offensive. There's people that don't want to have to deal with that. Why? Because they really got to get to the point that the only way to be saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on a cross. And so what they want to say is this. If I can get rid of the offensive part, then I can get saved because I can get past that. I can, you can't get to the cross unless you get to the blood. And too many people want to be offended by Jesus' words. Can I tell you, even in church, there's too many people that are offended by Jesus' words. Why? Because we want to make it seem like it's the pastor's words. We want to try to make it seem like it's the Sunday school teacher's words. We try to want to make it sound like it's the song leader's words. Zach, how could you sing that song? Right? So we, we want to make it seem like it's always somebody else's fault. But the problem is it, it's we've got an offense with whatever Jesus is dealing with us about. And until we can get past the fence, the offense of this, Jesus says the one who stumbles on that, the one who falls, is shattered to pieces. He goes on to say this part of it in verse 44. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now listen, it's not just an aspect of someone falling, but it's also a part of him falling on someone, which means this, there is a part of rejecting of the power of the Holy Spirit that when it falls, it's over. Sorry, why? Because it crushes. It's destroyed in that sense. You you do remember Jesus' parable that says, in the day when he comes back, they'll be crying for the mountains to fall on them so that they can hide. They'll be looking for anything they can. Why? Because he's always been an offense to them. And if you're sitting here this morning and Jesus Christ is an offense to you. If you're sitting here this morning and the way that Jesus is at, not me. I'm not asking you to live a certain way. Jesus is. All I do is preach the word that's already written. And so the only thing that I would ask is you to live what he asked. But to too many, it's an offense. We got to tr- try to figure out how to work around that. You see, because Humpty Dumpty, though he had a great fall, and though no one could put him back together again, that's not how this story ends. You know why? Because with Jesus, there's always hope. Jesus is the one that can take a life that's shattered. That when we look at it, now watch this. When we look at it with the person that's so drunk out, strung out on drugs, I don't know if you've ever talked to anyone that's actually been on drugs, that's been on the high, that it's absolutely crazy. They don't know what they're saying, and by the time it's over with, you won't know what they've said. But the thing is this, Jesus can take a life that's strung out on drugs and clean it up. Why? Because he specializes in taking lives that's shattered and putting them back together. Why? Because the drug couldn't do it. Why? Because man couldn't do it. Why? Because mom and daddy had no power over that. But see, there's this thing about Jesus Christ. He, he's this offense to some because it becomes a stumbling block. But to others, he's the, actually the stone that even though the builders rejected, that's where they build their life off of. And what he does is the only way that you can build your life off of that is not of our own doing. It's him taking a life that was in crumble and shambles and shattered and him put it back together and he builds it on the cornerstone. We put our lives on his life and he builds it the way that it needs to be. If we build it ourselves, what? If we build the church the way we want the church, then the church won't be what Jesus wants the church to be. 
Because I'll just tell you, some of the things that Jesus is getting ready to ask our church to do is going to be a defense to some of you all sitting here. Because y'all can't handle it. I can't believe he said that. That's what I'm saying. We can't even handle strong preaching anymore. Why? Because we'd rather have itching ears and we'll just vote somebody out and get somebody else in that we can pull the string. I cut my strings a long time ago. Jesus has got my strings. <laughs> so if you're trying to reach for them, you got to go through him. <laughs> but God is faithful. And he wants to take the life that's shattered. And he wants to put it back. What he's saying is this. Hands off, church. And let me do my work. Listen, he has called us to do the Great Commission, right? We are to go and to spread the gospel and even to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But listen, we can't put them back together. Listen, we go out and we do the Lord's work and then we go, what? We do the Lord's work. We do the Lord's work. Right, stand up here. I'm, I'm, really, I'm going to use you an example, right? So now I want you to put your hand on your head and, and then jump up and down. I just want to see if you do it. But anyway, so what we're doing here, so we're, we're in it, right? So what we do is we see our, our brother struggling. You know what we do? We see something. Now watch it. We see somebody in the world struggling. You know what we do? We come beside them. We walk with them. Now what? We walk with them and we share about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Yes. Praise the Lord, right? So then we get all excited about that and we continue to share Jesus. But then there's a time. Now watch. There's a time when all of a sudden maybe he trusts me enough and he says, hey, Pastor, I want to share something with you that I've been struggling with. And this is it. Right? I'm not speaking in tongues. That's just a will. But what happens is this. He tells me. And you know what I do? Now watch this. Sometimes we want to do this. Oh, that's what's wrong? You know what we need to be doing? Oh, that's what's wrong? Let me pray about it. You know who fixes him better than I do? Come on. When the Lord starts to deal with people about things in their life, take your hands off. Let his hands be on. Because I promise you, if you keep your hands on, it will be an offense and they'll fall. And they'll shatter. But when we step back and we say, you know what? Let me talk to you about the one who fixed my problem. And it didn't come through somebody else. It came through him. And he took a life that was broken and shattered to pieces. And the people of the world, I'll just call myself Humpty Dumpty, <laughs> that they couldn't put together. Again, he did it. You can say that. But that's what, listen, that's what he's looking for. But I'll just tell you that if you stand in the way of that, then Jesus has become an offense to you. And you will fall. Let me say that again. If you go against what Jesus is wanting to do, he'll fall on top of you. And he'll crush you. Why? Because you cannot stifle what God is going to do. He's going to keep moving. Now you can reject him. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit has to leave this place because there's others that say we want him. We want him to do the work. And that's what we're going to continue to pray for. So I just wonder this morning, they're going to come on up and they're going to play. I, I just wonder this morning, where are you at? You said you just preached the whole gamut this morning. I did. I preached the whole gamut. So if you don't know the Lord this morning, guess what you have? The opportunity to know the Lord. If you know the Lord and maybe you're struggling with some things, guess what you have this morning? You have the time to just come to him. Uh, maybe whatever it is, whatever the Lord, it doesn't even have to be anything I've preached on. Why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Why? When we take our hands off, he deals how he wants to. And so this morning, the altar is going to be open. Now listen, if you say, well, if I go down, people are going to think it's because of that. Let people think what they want to think. All they're doing is falling. Why? Because Jesus is an offense. Listen, if you're more worried about why people are coming to the altar than people are coming to the altar, then you've got a problem. And probably you need to be here long before they do. Why? Because Jesus is saying this, the prostitutes and the tax collectors get to heaven before you do. Jesus, I can't believe you'd say things like that. Actually, I can. I can't believe you'd say things like that.
because Jesus knew people. 